We need affirmative action for college boys, but who's going to pay for it? Hi, I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, there's a story in the Wall Street Journal that says, I'll give you the headline so those of you who have a subscription can look it up, a generation of American men give up on college. And then there's a little quote that says, I just feel lost. Um, However, the headline, as headlines often are wont to do, uh, is somewhat different than the actual story. And uh, Stephen Green, the story points out uh, that not only are male graduation rates from colleges, especially four-year colleges, but also two-year colleges, um, way down compared to female graduation rates, but undergrad uh, ratios are skewed in favor of females. In fact, in one of the worst case scenarios, uh, UCLA is only 41% male in the undergrad population right now. And there are other schools that are um, almost uh, as low as that. Um, So attendance is low, graduation is low. Enrollment is also skewed female rather than male and applications as well. In fact, um, more women apply, and listen to this number, 3.8 million women applied to go to university in the United States uh, in the 21-22 school year, 2.8 million men. Huge gap between them. Uh, Steve, this is a long-term trend. It's not uh, suddenly breaking news, but it's not getting any better. Uh, Some of the theories are uh, that men are just not interested in spending that much time, that much effort, and that much money into something that they don't really think is going to pay off. Do you think the economic argument is a sound one? I think it's a sound one. I don't think it's the only argument. I do want to uh, reflect on something, though. When I was a uh, freshman at the University of Missouri back in the fall of 1987, geez, I don't know how that happened so long ago. Uh, One of the... uh, One of the appeals of the school is that there were 51 women for every 41 men on campus. And I thought, you know what? I could use every little mathematical advantage I can get. (laughs) The odds are ever so slightly in my favor. I wanted to go to Vassar. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I I still ended up dating a uh, a woman from Stevens College, the the, uh, women's university up the road. Go figure. Anyway, uh, so yeah, if uh, I'm thinking right now, if the advantage is really 60, 40 women to men, that's a huge advantage for the few men who are still on college campuses. And if I weren't 52 years old, I'd think about enrolling at UCLA just just for the dating opportunities alone. Uh, The uh, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. Yeah, there is that. (laughs) There is that indeed. So joking aside, yeah, I think we've got two things going on. One, we'll just speak a harsh harsh truth here. Generally speaking, broadly speaking, men are better at math than women are. And the math for most college degrees is not very good. You get up loaded debt. You Don't get very many marketable skills. That's bad math. And it should be part of every student loan application process. Can you see the risk return reward for this degree you're looking for, the amount of debt you're going to rack up? Uh, Men seem to be doing that better because they're turning their backs on this. But there's also there's a lot of cultural stuff going on. Uh, Well, culture is all over our universities. We we see it in the news every single day. And, uh, you know, the the old Ivy League schools used to be this this wasp social club. And that wasn't right. We needed to open up our best schools to everybody, everybody who 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 can meet those high standards. and instead, what's happened is we've turned our, our universities across the country into private clubs, basically, for left wing women. And it's not a pleasant place to be where if you hold certain views uh, and you have certain genitalia and a certain lack of melanin, that there is a big not welcome sign on the university door. This is it, it is a huge turnoff. If you're treated like if you're going to treat somebody like the enemy, Don't be surprised if they just don't show up to give you a big fat check twice a year. Bill Whittle, uh, Baylor University here in Texas uh, has 60% of the undergrads are female. And the men's um, admission rate last year was actually 7% higher than the women's admission rate. In other words, Baylor's recruiting office is boosting male admissions to try to bring that level up. And some experts say it's not that men's applications are less competitive, so to speak, than female applications. They're just as good 
it when it comes to being students. It's just there aren't as many of them applying, and it gets much harder to get them in there. Uh, Bill, in general, as a conservative, I know you oppose affirmative action programs, uh, but there are two factors here. Um, you know, some uh, schools are starting to put a thumb on the scale in favor of boys just to bring those ratios uh, back into balance. But it's hard to get money to proactively recruit more males to apply when a lot of people in academia believe that males have already had the leg up historically. And so there's just no political will to stand up and say, yeah, we need to start a men's center to focus on men's recruiting and men's retention and men's graduation uh, among the, uh, the recruits that we have coming here. Bill, do you think that that would be a good expenditure of uh, tuition and taxpayer dollars to essentially have affirmative action for college men? Uh, not only that, but I think I'd actually support a, a massive government program, including an enormous tax uh, hikes in order to pay for it. I think we ought to mobilize an, an enormous effort to make sure that men do not go to university or college. This should be our goal. Um, we should we should make it a national mission. It's a national psych, uh, it's a national security issue. It's an economic issue. It's everything. Um, and I'm not kidding either. Uh, Steve was talking about it not being a pleasant place to be. My last class at the University of Florida, I was late, late, late in registering. The only thing left was like feminism. And you got to understand, it's 1982, 83, right? And even then, you know, I'm in a classroom, it's three guys and, and, and nothing but these croaking harpies telling me that men can't form real relationships and on and on. It's 1983. And it's gotten nothing but worse since then. And, and Scott, here's what I think is actually interesting and germane to this argument. I would like to know how people do after they get out of college, because I'd be willing to bet you that given the trends of universities these days, more and more of these women that are enrolling and graduating are graduating with degrees in study studies and <laughs> um, and and are coming out of college with large debts, too. So. It's not just a question of going to college. It's a question of what do you come out with? If if there are, I'm going to just throw these numbers around just to make the point, right? If it's 60% women and 40% men, and, and of that 60% women, most of them are studying gender studies, and of the 40% men, most of them are studying engineering, then what is the consequence downstream in terms of college? Now, I'm not suggesting that's the case, but you get the idea, right? And And furthermore, not only is college becoming less valuable and less uh, uh, fun. I mean, how, how many times do we hear on a, on a yearly basis of these false rape charges being leveled against guys and all, all, all of this stuff? It's, so one of the most important points to make here is that when you come out of college and you have a $200,000 hole to dig yourself out of, you don't have money to put yourself into business. Presumably, in the old days, you would go to school and you'd study to be a doctor, you'd study to be a, a lawyer or, or whatever, and you'd come out of college and university, and you would start a business. You can't get a loan to start a business if you have two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 in student debt. So while I find these numbers not surprising, I'm not alarmed by them. I don't think universities... I think they're done. I think I think they're absolutely finished. I think brick and mortar and ivy walls are done. They've managed to utterly destroy the value of what they were selling. They were selling an education. They provided indoctrination. And now uh, there, there is no chance I would ever send a, a child of mine, a male or female child, to an American university just so they could be so I could have the privilege of paying $100,000 a year per kid so that they could be taught to hate everything I am and everything I stand for yeah. by a bunch of idiots who don't know anything about anything. Hey, Scott, can I, I throw in one, one last thing? Yes. When, uh, when I was at Mizzou, I was, uh, you know, I was among the uh, journalism school students. We always, even, even in J school, we had somebody we could look down on. And those were the, uh, the, the then small minority of students pursuing useless degrees that we summed up as lesbian underwater basket weaving. The problem is today, the lesbian underwater basket weavers are in charge of the academy. Well, oddly enough, the people in charge of the academy are basically uh, still men but somehow they've created institutions that cannot attract men. 
And uh, you could, they're of course, make, make the conservative argument that they're males, as Bill uh, got in before I had a chance to complete the sentence. But <laughs> sorry, uh, that's OK. It, that, um, that can be part of the problem. But I think there are larger forces at work here. And there are lots of explanatory reasons for why something is happening. But I don't think you're going to see a direct causatory tie that that accounts for the primary movement that we're seeing here. I think basically we're moving away from an entire model of economics and where uh, academia thought themselves divorced from that corporate model of economics, from the industrial era model of economics, they're actually woven into that model. And so at some point, that pipeline from Ivy Tower to Ivory Tower, that pipeline that takes you from from the college to the corporation, um, it started to break down. And the academia the whole time is criticizing the corporations and then trying to prepare people to get jobs in those same corporations. I think a lot of young people, men included, um, are somewhat dissatisfied with that pipeline. Um, I've got two sons who took some college classwork, but one of them started his own business and is hustling as hard as he can to get that up and going and is doing a great job of it. Another is advancing rapidly within a, a company that he went to work for. Both of them have already earned more money in the time that they would have spent at college than I did before I was like 35 years old, I think. <laughs> And they're making much better decisions with their lives. I have a daughter who went to college openly saying, I'm getting an accounting degree as a plan B. And I just thought that that was genius because she didn't really want to be an accountant, but she was smart enough to know she better have a fallback skill in case times got hard. And so her real heart was in helping people. At first, she found that satisfaction in doing social work, uh, but she uh, also realized that she needed to eat food. And so uh, now she's a realtor and quite a gifted one at that. And she, so essentially she's in her own business um, and has done that as well. I, I do that not to hold up my own children as exemplars for a generation, although certainly given their parentage, it is uh, worthy to consider that. Uh, but I think that there are a whole generation of people coming up who are not idiots who are looking for lesbian underwater basket weaving degrees, but are people who are rationally looking at their future and saying, I watch my dad go to school, get a good job, work for the same company for 30 years, and either they dropped him like a hot rock before he got a chance to retire, which is what happened to my grandfather, or um, you know, now he's retired and I find out that he's always wanted to play violin. Um, and so they are not satisfied with cashiering their entire life into an institutional mold. And I actually really admire people for that. Some of these guys who aren't going to college, by the way, are not even applying to college. They're finding in the last year or so, decided to stay home and help to keep, make money for the family because their mom had to stay home and watch their younger siblings. So they went and got a job even if it was for $15 or $20 an hour. I actually have great hope for this generation coming up. And I think one of the, the best indicators that I've seen that our, that our future is in the hands of men who matter and men who will make good decisions and men who can be trusted with leadership is the fact that they are deciding not to apply to go to Ivy League schools or any other academic institution like this. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.